Good afternoon, and welcome back to part two of the Alias 6502 build. Um, again, we have Derek. Say hello, Derek. Hello. How are we doing? Fantastic. Uh, it's good to be back. I've been very excited about getting this done. Um, just as soon as I got the LED blinking uh, after the stream, I wanted to jump straight into getting the keyboard going um, but we had to wait because we've got to do it for the fans so um, to recap uh, the issue that we had last time where we couldn't get our LED blinking was because as Derek correctly identified the RAM was not working um, and so I had another look at the RAM after we finished up last time and <coughs> figured out that actually there was a sort of dodgy solder joint on the back but more importantly this pin in this corner had actually popped slightly out of the socket um, and it was stopping a whole bunch of the RAM pins from making contact so this is now running <clears throat> Excuse me. This is now running Derek's <clears throat> blank firmware that uses the stack, uh, and it's running correctly. So, fingers crossed, the RAM is all good, and I think we have basically completed part one to specification. Does that sound right, Derek? Looks good to me. Fantastic. Meanwhile, I will get out the stuff. So I've swept everything back into the box after last time, so we're going to have to go through and have a quick look at the uh, bits and pieces again today, but making sure I get this the right way up. Here is our build for today. Um, this is the keyboard and display interface. Do you want to say a few words, Derek, about how this kind of fits into the Alias ecosystem? Yeah, so if we go back to... Um the main compute is a sort of a variation of the Ben Eater 6502. And then once I got that running, I wanted some sort of a display. So I bought a seven segment module from JCAR that worked on an SPI bus. Um, and I thought that was pretty cool. And then I decided, yes, but that's buying modern, modern off the shelf modules. I want to be a bit more do it myself. Did it perhaps yeah. look like this? Yeah, so, um, yeah, exactly, exactly one of those. Um, so what I did was I started with the idea of um, shift registers driving seven segment modules. So what you've got there is six, uh, 74 HC 595 shift registers. And then they go through the load resistors down to the seven segment displays. And it's just a, a, a daisy chain of um, shift registers. So you can, it's, I don't have, I mean, SPI is weird because there's no official specification. You essentially drive it like an SPI bus and it plays nice. Yeah. Um, and can light up whichever segment of the screen you want. And it's persistent. So once you've, once you've pushed all the bits out to the shift registers, it just stays like that until you put different data or do a reset or whatever. So you don't actually need like a, a loop running and ROM refreshing the display all the time? Yeah, so I suppose a another way that you would do this if you were optimizing kind of for mass manufacture, right, you would multiplex the LEDs rather than just having each one driven by a shift register? Yeah, a lot of people do multiplex. Um, I was after something a bit simple and easier to understand. Yeah. As much as it's, as you say, it's not necessarily parts efficient. Um, I'm hardly worried about board real estate and I'm more interested in um, something that's really easy to understand. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense to me. And then the lower half of that board is um, just row and column buttons and I haven't even done anything with um, diodes. So at the moment, it, like key ghosting and rollover protection and all that <laughs> kind of stuff that you would put in a fancy keyboard. It doesn't have any of that. It's straight up row and column. Right. Um, 
That makes sense. Well, maybe that's a little yep. upgrade we can add to this later, because I've got many keyboard diodes. Nice. All right, cool. I'm just having a, a revisit of what we've got in the bag, uh, in the box, rather. Um, very excited to be applying the key labels, so hopefully we get to that point today. I've been thinking about ways to try and cut them out evenly, but I think we're just going to have to freehand it. Yeah, I, I just freehand it, and it still looks kind of reasonable. Yeah, I think it'll be all right. I the most the most boring part of this build is going to be those resistors, because you're looking at 48, <laughs> um, 48, 48 resistors one by one. Well, a perfect opportunity to put our friend to work. <clears throat> And questions from the chat is missing some letters. Well, not when we're going for hexadecimal, not full alphabet. And no, you can't IRC on this because it doesn't have. <laughs> it doesn't even have a serial out, let alone a serial in at this point. So, no. Stephen um, only knows one way of interacting with the computer, and it's hassling people on IRC. So. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fair. That is kind of his trademark. Um, that's all right. Just think of it like a CTF challenge. So last weekend, uh, I very slightly helped out our friend uh, SS23 here um, and a few other folks to compete in the Sekai CTF, which was extremely good fun, very difficult. I did not get any of the flags, but um, Sekai came second overall in, in the global stakes. So. A small round nice. of applause from the audience for, for Stephen and friends. It was very impressive to be a fly on the wall for that and watch CTF happen. Uh, cool. So I think we've got all the bits and pieces now. Um, I'm going to scroll through the instructions, although... Where did we get to? Where did we get to? Where did we get to? So I'm not sure if you're going to have sockets for the um, shift registers. I'm not sure if that made it to the box, but you can just solder them straight to the board should you wish. And then we've got some capacitors above the shift registers just because that's good to do with mm -hmm. um, chips, the load resistors, the seven segment modules, and then the keys and then there's some header pins that join the two boards together so there's actually not a huge amount of complexity it's just the sheer number of resistors yeah. that does get fit in no it looks good looks good so i think we concluded that these resistors are slightly too low value and so it's going to make the display very bright but i'm going to do it anyway because i think it's going to look good on on camera and worst case we come back later and swap them out again yeah, so when I did the when I did the design on that, um, I looked up the data sheet for the seven segment modules, but what I've actually got is like max current rather than typical or lower end or whatever when right. it's the math. Right. So I think what you've got there is three hundred and something ohm resistors when I've done another build um, with eight hundred ohm resistors and it's still perfectly bright enough. Nice. I think you could probably even get away with full one K resistors. Yeah. I, I, it's tempting to try and change it, but I think I, I don't think I have enough of any one given resistor. So I reckon let's just yeah. do it. So we work with the four thirties. So we'll get straight in there. Basically, I think we'll do the resistors first, unless you've got other ideas, Derek. Uh, yeah, resistors first seems reasonable. Yeah. Nice. We'll go for this first slot on the little bendy jig thing. Um, as a result of the last stream, a friend of mine has asked for a print of the Bendy Jig, so um, that's going to happen. So I think every resistor on this this side of the board is all, at least these ones are all current limiting for the LEDs. All, all, the, all the resistors for the current limiter are the whatever value yeah. you've got. Well, um, the ones down the side by the ones. keypad. Um, I think are typically 1k, but again, they just pull up, pull down, you can yeah. get away with whatever you've got. Very good, very good. Alright. I think I'm going to put these in in batches, because that's usually the way to do this. So, we'll try and load in a few. I feel like these, again, might be, um, 
might be pads that would benefit from having the holes and pads made slightly bigger if you've got enough kind of routing room available. You can see how they're quite tight, but I think they're still going to yeah. be, be fine. Okay, so I think you, you've you made some additional further board revisions since our last chat. Yeah, so I took feedback off the first station and I've changed some of the... Um, the footprint size for a lot of the chips on the on the compute board nice. um, which is i mean it's very subtle it's like half a millimeter bigger kind of a thing yeah um but yeah you're right you have to then redo the, the track routing to, to because gaps are different yeah uh, that makes sense i think that would definitely make it easier to do those um those few sockets that were a little bit of a struggle Let's get some of this stuff out of the way while I'm doing this. Make sure that we do have the correct he correct hex. Uh, sorry, the correct shift registers, eight bit shift registers. What do we got? Seven four five nine five. That sounds right. That's the stuff. Good. Have you had a pleasant Saturday, Derek? Yeah, pretty good. Good, excellent. I'm happy about this weather that we've got this weekend, that's for sure. Not quite summer yet, but pretty close. Uh, I'll take anything at this point, frankly. Um, I don't know if we mentioned it last time, but I think Wellington's had the wettest winter on record, or possibly the second wettest winter on record, which is been a real slog, so anything that gets us closer to the end of that, I'm not going to complain about. Um, so, after we complete building this, we're going to have to build the monitor ROM. Um, so do you want to just talk about, actually Derek, do you want to just give us a wee explanation of how the 6502 chip itself because on this board you know cpu is right here how do we get from the cpu into the keypad do you want to give us a quick rundown of how that that kind of interface works yeah so um cpu the the three little chips to the right hand side of the cpu are just some glue logic that does memory decoding so based on whatever's on the address bus it lights up chip enable on RAM ROM or one of the two I.O. chips. And then the right hand of the two I.O. chips drives um, some header pins that go up to the upper board, which is both the row and column for the keypad and it's also the SPI bus for the display, but it's also the SPI bus that talks to the SD card module, which we haven't put in yet. Yep. Um, so that one I.O. chip on the right-hand side um, is essentially all for system stuff. And then the other I.O. chip is completely unused for experimentation and making smoke. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, I'm very excited about that part. So for, for folks who might not be familiar with this kind of platform, the implication of that then is that there are some special memory locations that you can read and write to which get decoded into the I.O. chip, is that correct? Yeah, so this is where um, everything exists in memory, that's the only way of talking to the system. So the 6522 gives you, I think it's somewhere around a dozen or 16 uh, addresses and that gives you things like the data direction register, the data itself, um, there's some uh, timers and interrupts as well, uh, et cetera. It doesn't have any nice A to D converters or anything like that, but yeah. it does give you five volt, five volt GPIO kind of functionality. And as I say, there's also, it can generate interrupts on um, changes on those IO lines or it can generate interrupts based on an internal uh, timer register. Because the 6522 is a very, it's a classic chip, right? It's part of the, the OG 6502 loadout that you would find in any computer that uses this 
Co correct, correct. So when um, when Moss Technologies designed the 6502, they specifically designed a couple of other chips to be in the same family, of which was the 6522 for I.O. stuff. Yeah, and it's a little bit of a departure, or there's, there's, there's kind of competing views about how you do that external interface uh, type stuff on these... Um, small micros, right? Because some some of the competing CPUs have kind of like dedicated in and out registers, right? And they've got special instructions. Correct. Um, like I think does the Z80 have have um, I/O on the chip? I'm pretty sure it does, doesn't it? I'm pretty sure it does. Yeah. Yeah, because I know the IBM PC, which is sort of a bit more closely related to that. You know, you've got your in and out instructions that are fully separate from from the system memory. Um, so that means that there's a few other chips that the that you could attach to this, right? So the, there's a serial UART, I think, that's in the Yeah, there family. is a serial UART of which I can't actually immediately remember what the part number is. Yeah, no, but yeah there no, is no. absolutely a UART. Um, I think there's a couple of other alternatives for I.O. chips as well that have um, slightly different functionality. Right. And it's always interesting to me to think about, like, um, say, a Commodore 64, for instance, how it's kind of that mixture of the minimum number of 6502 family sort of support chips, but then also you've got the, the custom Commodore stuff in there and that that's kind of you know the thing that was the big compatibility blocker in a lot of ways between various 6502 machines like you know for instance the the Commodore 64 and the Apple II right they're both essentially the same architecture machine but they've made such different decisions about how to kind of lay out the system and what peripherals they're going to use and the memory maps and all that kind of stuff yeah um, <laughs> um... The other thing is the Commodore 64, everyone calls it a 6502 machine. Yeah, that's from right. A software point, from a software point of view, it is kind of. Yeah. But you can't actually, if you drop in a true 6502 CPU into the socket, it won't work. Yeah. Because actually, I think it was a 65... 6510, I think, is the... Yeah, 6510, I yeah. think. Yeah, I'm um, pretty sure that's right. Almost pin compatible, but it had an extra couple of pins for memory map, memory banking. Yeah. Um, which made it slightly unique. Um, and it's exactly the same as when you look at the Nintendo. Everyone says, oh, but the original Nintendo was a 6502. Again, I think they had their own subtle variation. Yeah. So from a... From a programming perspective, yes, that's 6502 code, but from a hardware perspective, it was a custom spin off the chip. Yeah, and I think, actually, I don't know if you have seen this, there's a there's a chap in Wellington who actually, I think his name is um, Monotone, makes a, an adapter board, or is working on an adapter board that lets you use a standard 6502 in applications where a 6510 uh, is required, which I thought was quite interesting. I had heard that someone was building an adapter board. I didn't realize it was a dude in Wellington. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, uh, I caught up with a, another microcomputer enthusiast colleague of mine a few weeks ago, uh, last weekend, and, um, and found out about this. So that's something that we're going to have to find out more about, because I think, um, yeah, it'd be interesting to, to see what they've done to make that work, I think. Mm. And it's not to say that Commodore didn't use 6502s like real 6502s and some things as well. Like I think the 1541, the, the standard Commodore 64 disk drive is a 6502 rather than a 6502. It is, it is, it? A, it is a true 6502 on the, on the disk yeah. drive. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the standard, um, one of the standard anecdotes about the, the 1541 is that it's, it costs more and is more capable than the computer that it plugs into, right? Yeah, pretty much. Did you see that um, that neat uh, demo that someone put out? Uh, it was probably a couple of years ago now. Generating composite video from the the I/O pins on a fifteen forty one. I'm I hadn't seen it, but I'm not at all surprised. Yeah, it's a C sixty four demo where you can unplug and turn off the C sixty four after you start the demo. 
very nice. But, uh, but you do have to cut the disc cable. <laughs> well, yeah. But then, the thing, as we discussed last time, the 6502 became popular enough and embedded in enough things that after a while they actually came out with an enhanced, like a 16-bit version, um, the 65816. Yeah, I don't and, know much about those. Yeah, so it's it's still 40, it's still 40 pin. It powers up in 6502 compatibility mode. And then you run a, you basically poke a special internal register and it kicks into um, 816 mode. And at that point you can access, I believe it's a meg or a couple of megs of RAM um, right. because it gives you a full 24-bit bus um, and all of the wonders that come with that. And it runs at a pretty, it runs at a pretty good speed too. I believe they made them up to um, 14 odd megahertz. Interesting. Were there machines that used that? Because I'm really not very familiar with it. Uh, I'm pretty sure there would have been stuff that yeah. would have used it. Um, it feels like the kind of thing you'd find in a kind of like proto affordable early Unixoid workstation sort of thing of the era, right? Like a bit of a step up from the sort of like the the 6809 uh type workstations right yeah uh Wik wikipedia claims it was in the apple 2gs ah, and, okay. and the super nintendo ah interesting yeah we 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 didn't get much traction with the gs here in aotearoa which um uh means that i've never actually seen one in the flesh i think uh, the Apple II was very successful and popular in education particularly, but I think by the time the 2GS was happening we kind of moved on a bit here. It's interesting to know that it was in the Super Nintendo, I didn't realise that. Makes sense, so, I suppose. So Western Design still make the, um, uh, the 816, so you can buy it through Western Design. Yeah. And it is, it is 40 pin... It is 40 pin, almost pin compatible with a 6502. Yeah. It's, there's not a huge amount of people using them for um, homebrew because the bus arrangement is a complete hassle. Oh, okay. And because of the way it works, you still get a 16 bit address bus and they multiplex the address onto the data bus. So on the low half of the clock cycle, the data bus is being used as the address bus and you have to latch uh, the data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to latch the data bus to get the upper half of the address bus. And when the clock goes high, the data bus is then being the data bus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. yeah the, the, there's a, a bunch more support chips required to do all that weird data address bus latching stuff. So there are people who have successfully done um, homebrew projects with the 816, right. but it is a lot fiddlier to work with. Yeah, it sounds neat. There's something attractive about that, um, the weirdness of it, I guess, make, and, and the relative obscurity, perhaps. I feel like it would be really neat to make a kind of, um, you know, like, fantasy micro system that never existed. Could address up to a megabyte of RAM, but it was still sort of basically an 8-bit micro. Yeah, one of the other things that people do in the homebrew community is they start with a 6502, pretty much exactly what we've got here. And they take, um, using the memory decode, they take a couple of a couple of bytes out of the address um, yeah. space and they they then latch that and turn it into the upper section of a, an address bus. Yeah. So what you end up with is a, somewhere near the top of RAM, you have a magic address that is sort of for, for memory banking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it'd be great. And that's compar comparatively easy to do with just a little bit more glue logic. Mm. It would be really neat to to have a um, kind of Unix-ish, you know, system that never existed. Like, a, I don't know, there's something about that, like, system that shouldn't be. It exceeds its capabilities by being Frankenstein strapped together out of, um, you know, a, a shoebox full of banked... Uh, banked defective RAM chips or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I think, I don't know if you've seen Fusix or something that's been doing the rounds a little bit in the last few years. It's kind of like a Unix clone that's easy to port to microcontrollers and other weird platforms. 
No, I haven't heard that. That could be interesting to fiddle with. Yeah. Someone, um, oh, I have to remember the name of the, the, the site, but someone, port, it's been ported to platforms that really you wouldn't expect, like um, the ESP8266, for instance, which when you think about it, how do you do Unix on the ESP8266? Because it doesn't have um, executable memory. Um, yeah. Because it's one of those chip architectures where the code is on is in ROM and that's a wholly separate address space. And so, the way they got around it, which is amazing and horrifying, is um, every single context, every single uh, context switch in the cooperative multitasking environment, pages out to the SD card. Wow. Yeah, and it's actually interactively usable apparently, according to the author. Um, you know, he said just running basic Unix shell commands and things, you actually don't really notice the fact that there is no, <laughs> that, that you're swapping, you know, enforced swap uh, to the SD card. It would be interesting to know how long an SD card lives uh, when you're doing Yeah, I was about to say, that would be pretty hard on the SD card. Yeah, but I thought it was kind of neat. So we're almost, we're almost halfway, well, we are halfway on the resistors. So we've got the whole top row sitting in the board and we'll just solder those. Um, I don't know if you've been following any of the Oxide computer stuff that's that's been happening in the last few days. No, doesn't hey, ring any bells. Uh, so for context, Oxide computer is a company that is attempting to bring back, I, well, it's not their explicitly stated goal, but I, I think they're sort of trying to bring back some of the, the glory days of Sun um, with sort of custom-made server hardware that's x86, but everything else is custom-engineered, and they're, they're offering it as this kind of rack-scale compute unit if you want to do serious compute on-prem, but you don't want to spend a bunch of time dealing with all of the endless legacy code and and vendor nightmare stuff you can kind of buy it straight from the manufacturer and they you know they know what they're doing and it's all custom built to be friendly and pleasant but there's been a bit of discussion recently about the kind of milestones that they've hit because i think they're not too far away from shipping their first sort of rack scale computer um because they basically implemented x86 but without any of the legacy baggage um so they've got their own service processor that runs, I think it's a, an open source Rust project that kind of controls the whole thing. And then they've moved heaps of the, the, the stuff that would normally be kind of like service management mode in the CPU and running, you know, a, a hideous hidden Minix at ring negative one and all of that sort of jazz uh, straight into the Illumos kernel um, as part of the startup process so the whole okay. thing becomes very inspectable and and kind of nice looking really yeah yeah and that's one thing i did like about sun is the like the boot prom was very very tidy yeah and yeah when you when you get away with all get away from all of the bios legacy garbage i mean even modern ufi is making quite the effort to be sort of bios similar or bios compatible mm -hmm. To be able to walk away from that is quite nice. Yeah. If, any, if anything, that's one of the things that I've often said is the difference between um, like the x86 crowd and the Apple environment is every 10 or 15 years, Apple says we're changing our architecture completely. Um, there's a whole new way and yeah. you either come with us or you don't. Whereas the Microsoft land is we're going to be compatible all the way back to 1982, regardless <laughs> yeah. of whether it brings us bugs and pain and suffering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I don't know why, something about this project, the kind of like garage engineering spirit of, of the, the old early days of the, the microcomputer and things, is just making me think about Oxide as well. The people who work there are lovely, like um, Jess Frizzell, who has presented at KiwiCon, uh, a few times is there, and Brian Cantrell's there. Um, I'm sure folks in the chat can, can name a few other names of, of cool people working there, but it's very exciting stuff to watch. And um, uh, yes, it, it, it awakens the same good cheer in me with their kind of 
Frankensteining of X86 is, um, you know, thinking about these fantasy machines, fantasy 8-bit micros that never existed and perhaps never should. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I really support the stuff they're doing because getting people out of the monolithic kind of, you know, landlordy cloud providers and back onto their own computers is going to be good for everyone, really. Especially if they can make the kind of experience comparable, which is their part of their sell, I think. Plus, who doesn't want a computer the size of a server rack? I say. I'm all for big server rack as long as it's not too noisy. <laughs> yeah, it'll be interesting to see if the if um, be interesting to see how much of a kind of like hurricane it is when they fire it up. Um, okay, all of that looks sort of all right. It's um, surprisingly hard to solder these little ring pads because uh, you don't get that kind of uh, meniscus effect where the solder sort of wets out into a big pad and so it's quite easy to get blobs but um, I'm satisfied with what we've done there so Twitch QA check that one give me some feedback in the chat I think it'll do I reckon we're looking all right what do you reckon Derek Hard to say by camera, but yeah, it looks good enough to me. Very good. <clears throat> what is this link, Trogs? Oh yeah, Stephen says we should uh, check the check the um, the the public domain NASA construction standards. You must be familiar with those, I imagine, Derek. Of course. Yes. Of course. Uh, friend of I mine. Don't, I don't think I don't think we need this to be. Um, NASA certified. What if it? What if I have to take this computer in a rocket, Derek, and, and it vibrates apart? I, I don't know. I don't know if I could handle that. I need to be able to do my hunt the wampus and when I'm in orbit. Did you Did you not read the the um the EULA that comes with it that says not to be used for um uh, space projects? Is that a thing? Did you actually make a EULA that says says I'm not allowed to take the computer in a rocket? No, but I might now. <laughs> well, I'm just reminded of um, the EULA that came with Windows NT4 that said you're not allowed to use it to run a nuclear power station. Right. Meanwhile, Sir Clive Sinclair uh, famously, well, he famously said that the, the ZX81, if you had the 16K expansion pack, you could run a nuclear power plant off it. That might be... That I can see that. Wonderful. So long as you don't wobble the expansion pack, right? Um, yeah, I guess uh, once once you've shaken the bugs out of this, we need a we need a wire wrapped um, core memory high vibration uh, version of the alias six five zero two. Specifically for taking it into space. Yeah. Well, okay. we could we could just take it in a fighter jet, maybe. You get me the fighter jet, and we'll we'll go from there. All right. Good. Excellent. So Trogs has pasted a link into the chat. Uh, talk from Brian Cantrell about open source firmware. Okay, yeah, that probably is a good thing to follow up if anyone's interested in a bit more about what they're doing and the philosophy of the Oxide computer stuff. Um, they also have, the, the thing that sucked me into the project initially was that they have and had a really nice podcast where they um, just have a kind of garage chat with various uh, pleasant Silicon Valley folks. So. Yeah, Ken Sheriff on there, and oh, I don't know who else, but that was worth checking out, I think. How many resistors do you think you could solder in one session before you became physically unable to um, to do more of them? I'm thinking about that. I mean, even just doing the 48 for this board yeah. is is a reasonably good run at it. Like maybe maybe 150, 200 before you start losing the plot. Yeah. What we need, I guess, is a wave soldering wave soldering system or a soldering a CNC soldering robot, maybe. Yeah. I think I have seen CNC soldering robots available on AliExpress. Um, the other thing I haven't tried to do yet is build any of the monitor firmware for this 
but I'm hoping that what we used last time to get the blank code working will will spring into action and uh, allow us to build the um, build the monitor firmware. Do you want to do you want to very briefly explain the idea of monitor firmware? Yeah. So <clears throat> soon as the soon as the computer powers up, it jumps to reading a couple of bytes out of the very, very top of memory, which in our case is ROM, and that gives it gives it an address to jump to to execute code, which again is traditionally somewhere in ROM. Yeah. The code I've written, um, it started out with, let's just read the keypad and then poke things into memory. So there's a monitor ROM where you can literally, through the keypad, manipulate values into anywhere in RAM, which means you can toggle code directly into RAM by just typing it in on the hex keypad and then executing it, and that works quite nicely. Who would need more user interface than that, I ask you? Well, see, then the thing I thought about was if you're going to have a program of more than a few dozen bytes, toggling it in on the keypad is a bit of a, bit of a nightmare. So being that I had an SPI bus and the... SD card can be used via an SPI bus. I then started doing can we read code from the SD card into RAM and execute it. Nice. That's um, pretty, it's pretty sophisticated for a for an eight bit system, eh? I, yeah. <clears throat> doing initializing an SD card correctly is a bit fiddly. There's lots of documentation out there. And some of it is wrong because there's different blogs disagree with one another as uh -huh. to how it should be done. If you don't care too much about the exact kind of SD card you've got, it's not too bad. But when you get into needing to support um, like SD, MMC, SCHC, etc., right, the, initi the initialization becomes a bit of a headache. Yeah, about the most I've ever looked at is the kind of um, one bit mode which I guess is what you're using here? Uh, essentially, um, it becomes, yeah, you, you can initialize it into SPI mode yeah. um, and go from there. So once you've initialized the SD card, reading a single, uh, a single 512 byte chunk from the SD card just using like LBA addressing yeah. um, is, is reasonably easy. Yeah. So I got, I got that working. Nice. And then I decided that the next logical step up was um, file system support. So I've gone for FAT32 file system support. Oh, nice. Uh, read only. Yeah. And uh, only 8.3 file names, so no long file name support. Yeah, fair enough. Well, you're going to run out of memory pretty quickly on an 8-bit system if you're letting, if exactly. you're letting people use so, up all of the memory for file names. So there's a bunch of routines in the ROM that allow you to initialize the SD card uh, search the directory structure, find a file, load a file, blah, blah, blah. Neat. Oh, sounds... And then, and then I've tied that into a routine simply called bootstrap that on power up, the machine will initialize the SD card and look for a file called 00.bin. If it finds 00.bin, it will load it and run it. Nice. And if it doesn't find 00.bin, it will kick back into that monitor one where you can toggle stuff directly into memory. Cool. Well, if you're not feeling squeamish, we'll have a quick spelunk through the code before we build it, I suppose. And, and, um... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, I can try and explain um, cool. what, what what I was thinking when I wrote the code, if I can remember that far. <laughs> um, it's 100% hand-rolled hand 6502 assembler, um, and I've never really been an expert in 6502 assembler, so there's... Probably a lot of efficiencies could be had along the way. Yeah. But it works. Um, I don't think we need efficient for this, right? Like, it, it feels like it fits the philosophy of the machine, right? Of being observable and understandable and... Exactly. Approachable. It'll load, it'll load a 4K file in about one second. Ah, oh, fine. Easy. Anyone who's ever used a data set or an unmodified 1541 would, could, would, would never complain about that. Exactly. Um, Sounds practically ergonomic. 
<laughs> yeah. The entire Fat 32, so the, the whole ROM with Fat 32 and all of the routines to update the display and all the routines to handle interrupts and all the stuff for reading the keypad weighs in, I think, about two and a half kilobytes. That's pretty and good. The, and it's a 32K ROM chip, so there's heaps of headroom yeah. to add more to the ROM. What I'm thinking is some um, either fixed point or floating point map routines. Yeah, that's pretty cool. 502, all you get in 6502 land from a math perspective is add and subtract, and that's all you've got. Yeah. Um, e even a basic multiply doesn't exist unless you roll your own. I do love the idea of software multiply. Uh, again, it's something, I don't know, there's just something agrarian and gentle and pleasing about the idea of a CPU that you have to kind of like hand roll your multiply instructions. Yeah. The other one that I have hand rolled and put into the ROM routine is a random number generator. Ah, yes, I remember we were talking about that. That's a uh, which, linear which feedback does have, shift, re shift yeah, register. Yeah, sh shift register magic. The problem is, how do you know whether it's working correctly? Because, I mean, it gives me numbers that appear to be random, but that doesn't mean it's working right. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's never going to be... It's never going to be cryptographically sound. Yeah, no, but, LFSR you know, is, a, you know, it's a periodic random number generator, right? So Yeah. That's fine, though. It'll be good enough for Hunt the Wumpers. Exactly, exactly. Um, so I have actually written um, a, a classic guessing game where computer picks a random number and then you take a guess and computer says higher or lower. So that exists in the, uh, in the GitHub code collection. Cool. Cool, cool. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the... It's been a few years since I looked at it now, but there's a document floating around that... Um, I don't remember if it's an official thing or not, but it's uh, just an explainer of how all of the Altair works. That could be kind of cool. Yeah, it really blew my mind to read it, particularly... I was interested in how they implemented the front panel stuff for the LTR. Um, because the LTR used a discrete CPU, but you can still view the contents of registers and memory and things on the front panel. Um, yes. And rather than having a kind of monitor program running in the background, it's does these kind of amazing, basically, I guess what you'd call microcode in modern parlance shenanigans where it halts the CPU and then it just hardwires an examine instruction onto the bus and then it clocks it just enough times, uh, you know, to get it to do the thing and then halts it again and that, that allows the data and address um, lines to be read out through the front panel they get kind of latched as part of that yep <clears throat> uh, and I thought that was quite amazing in its simplicity and it's kind of like you know it underscores how computers can multitask and things right you the CPU is not really s all that stateful in terms of what it's doing per se it's just kind of stateful at that low level and you can um, you can just kind of be like well I'd like you to just execute this instruction for a sec and then go back to what you were yep. doing and that's fine which I mean is kind of botching an interrupt. Yeah. Um, I think it... which is something. So on the topic of interrupts, um, so one of those three Blue Logic chips, um, the little chips on the compute board, is just an AND gate that allows me to bring interrupts from both of the I/O chips together onto the CPU. Oh, yes. the CPU. The CPU gives you one interrupt line. Yeah. Yeah, I think we talked about that last time, didn't we? And then you were just kind of. You just kind of in, uh, check each chip to see whether an interrupt happened or not. Yeah, exactly. Um, there are actually two interrupt lines. There's one that's just a standard interrupt line that you can turn on and off in software. And the other one is the non-maskable interrupt, which right. funnily enough, you cannot turn off. Yeah. So I could have potentially put the two chips on the two different interrupt lines, but I haven't. So the non-maskable isn't being used in this design at all. What is the NMI used for in other designs, do you know? Uh, not certain. I believe that... I believe that Commodore used it as part of the... Uh, was it the stop... Uh, the run break 
stop, restore, key combination. Yeah, maybe, I, I don't that, know. I've never, no, I think that triggered a non-masker bolt. Right. I've never had much to do with that because I so seldom ran stuff that was, you know, it seldom ran stuff that you could return to basic. Um, and I was never loading things from tape when I had a, a C64, so... Um, I just, whenever any mice still give me a mild horror from the the 90s and, you know, dealing with crappy old off-cast, cast-off cheap PCs that I got second-hand or from old businesses or whatever, and it was altogether too common that you would start getting NMI interrupts breaking through, uh, you know, into what you were doing when the hardware was starting to go bad. So that was my kind yep. of early introduction to an NMI, was basically it's a sign that, yep, this 486 might not have much left in it, um, better move on to the next one in the pile. Um, interestingly, part of the, I saw a thing on YouTube a few months ago about part of the way that they made the 6502 so efficient from a gate perspective, a number of transistors, is they optimized every corner that they possibly could. Yeah. And when, when you power up the CPU, you hold the reset line low for a couple of clocks and then release it. Yeah. That is that is treated internally as an interrupt. <clears throat> and if you examine the data and address bus, what happens when you do a reset is it pushes the current address, which is garbage, onto the stack, and the stack pointer is garbage. Um, it writes the current address into some random location in memory, and then it loads this interrupt pointer out of RAM, uh, out of ROM, and then it jumps to that interrupt pointer. So that's that's how it does the reset factor, is it actually internally treats it as if it was a interrupt. Right. Oh, I'm struggling to get my head around that, but I'm sure it makes sense. Um, hello, Eccentric, from the chat. Thank you for joining us today and appreciating. Uh, I went for the spooky October-themed um nail polish today so nice to get some appreciation for that um i think we're basically done on the resistors uh at least for the current limited <coughs> ones the soldering so good to me. is a little bit sad because aforementioned um challenging pad design but we know about that so that's fine um well what do you reckon oh we probably should put the current limiting resistors in as well Sure, why not? Sorry, not current limiting resistors, the, the pull-up pull resistors. Yes. <clears throat> excellent, excellent. Uh, there's some honesty to be had in, a, in an old school design where you can't just say, set GPIO pull-ups on <laughs> in a configuration register. Yeah, no, all, all done in hardware. Yeah. Yeah, very nice. I read, <clears throat> for those who, who care about the finer detail, I did read about the difference between using pull-up resistors and pull-down resistors in a keypad design. Oh, yes, and yes, it, go on. And it, it changes the current usage. It changes how much current is used while you're idling or whether you push a key or whatever, depending on the chip driving it as to whether it's the whole open collector, open emitter, yeah. TTL versus CMOS, all that rabbit hole. Um, and I appreciate there is a difference, and then I just went, I don't care. So <laughs> I believe I believe I'm doing pull down resistors in this case. Okay, yeah, that's something I looked into a few times as well in the past, and I don't remember the the details either. So we were using, I think we were using some three point something k resistors and the rest of it, but I don't know what I've done with those. So I think we'll call it a science experiment, but I'm going to use the ten k's. Um, Yep, that should be fine. Uh, I, yeah, completely sure that yep. that will work fine that as well. That should be fine. Um, it's Again, for those, not, for those not following along from last time, um, I thought I had ordered 1K resistors, but it turns out that in the box turned up 10K resistors, which were a little on the large side, but for pull-up, pull-down, probably won't matter. Yeah, I think it's basically fine, because we're basically... Um, so where do they... They go to the 6522, don't they? Yep. Yeah, so I mean... The inputs on the 6522, they'll be fit. Um, 
inputs anyway, right? So they only need a voltage change I would and a few micro so, yeah. amps of current flow, yeah. Cool. ASS23 suggesting we cut them into one tenths and use a smaller bit of them. It doesn't quite work like that. Well, we could we could stack ten of them. I'm creative thinking, but I don't see it working out. We could we could stack ten of them in parallel, right? This is true. This is true. You could do that. Yeah, just gonna just out of pure curiosity, see what the tolerance is on these. Oh yeah, nine point nine three. Close enough. So we'll go this way around with the red band towards the bottom of the board. These are very slightly chonkier resistors as well, which is nice. They're very tactile. Yeah, well, I can't claim that I can order them yeah. again because I don't actually know what they are, being that they're different to what I thought I ordered. Yeah, I think these are just generic wherever JCAR gets them from resistors, so... Um, yeah. More, more of a coincidence than anything, I would say. I always, at, at the bane of my existence when I was getting into electronics when I was a child was these cardboard strip things, because if you don't know the technique for getting the parts out, they always leave like a little raggedy piece of tape and leaves the lead sticky and it's a nightmare what's the secret that we don't know <laughs> well i'm not sure that I, I it's just a thing that that i've kind of developed um uh what's the what's the word um I've just kind of figured it out um as i've been going but you, I mean, you, you still get a little bit, I don't know if you can see it on the camera there, there's a little bit of crud on the end of that, but you still get a little bit. But if you kind of pull and twist to loosen them from the, um, the, the reel rather than kind of just pulling them straight or, or tearing, you get slightly better results, I reckon. So, like, I, I usually okay. grab the resistor here and hold here and then kind of roll it while I'm pulling it to, and you get quite a clean result. I don't know. Many years ago, I did meet someone that actually would clip them off the reel. Mm. They would leave a piece of the leg behind in the in the um, cardboard strip, and they would actually use side cutters and clip them off the reel at both ends. It's honestly not a bad way to do it if you're worried about getting a bit of sticky stuff kind of in the pad or whatever on the board. So another little assembly tip here, which um, we probably didn't explicitly talk about when you're doing through hole parts and you want them to stay in place uh, prior to soldering always good to splay the legs out a little bit like that and that keeps them kind of tight against the board while you do the soldering there are many many solutions for this particular problem as well but it's something that's always worked relatively well for me good work on the uh, emote game there trolls appreciate that yeah, if someone could just keep an eye on Stephen in the chat, that would be great, thanks. Don't let him get too carried away with his fantasies. Alright, that's it for resistors. Get those clipped. Oh, that was close. Almost cut this one without soldering it. Did you have a um, <clears throat> a kind of first program that you wanted to run, Derek? That was kind of your yeah, yeah I built a computer benchmark. There's a program in the GitHub that's just called Count, and it literally counts as fast as it can. Yeah. Which is entertaining, but it also it weighs in at forty something bytes, which means you can toggle it in on the keypad. Nice. Okay, that seems like a smart. Because some some of the other some of the other example code weighs in at um, several hundred bytes, which becomes a bit of a pain in the ass to, to toggle and mm. byte by byte. But um, the count routine just increments the display by one as fast as it can. 
And yeah, I think it weighs in at 40 or 50 bytes. I mean, it could be worse. You know, I've got other computers that are even harder to program. <laughs> like, um, this is the Elf membership card by Lee Hart, who uh, makes actually a few other kind of Z80 and similar related yep. things, but, you know, toggling it a bit at a time. It's very zen. You have to be very zen about it, otherwise it's upsetting. I have his uh, Z80 membership card. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I'd love to put yeah, one I've of got, those. I've got the kit of that kicking around somewhere, but I haven't actually um, got around soldering it together. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, you can't... I can't easily get this one apart, but... You know, it's solid packed. Stacks, they are, they are very, very tight. Yeah. Right in there, so I um, thanks to Tom for sending me some Altoids tins from the US, so I could finish this. Um, Interestingly, the kit I bought came with Altoids tin. Yeah, uh, this one did as well, but um, there were some circumstances where I had to replace the tin. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I've got several Altoids tins in stock now, thanks to a kind nice. benefactor. Uh, it does still have a minty smell. Stephen asks if it tastes like Altoids. The inside of the computer has a minty smell still, which is nice. All right. Uh, I reckon we're getting, getting somewhere. Um, I think I'm going to take a two-minute break, and I'm going to drink some water, and then we'll come back to the stream, and we'll put some buffer chips in there. Nice. Um, moving on with the Alias 6502 project, the, the plan I reckon, or you reckon, is that we get the kind of display portion going and test that as a unit. Yeah, so the display is independent independent enough from the keypad that you can finish off the display and test that without even changing the code. Cool. So the code you've currently got that blinks the LED, because it's cycling the data line and the clock line, it will actually just shift a bit all the way across the display, which means in check all your display segments are working and wired correctly and so forth Neat. without having to change any code, which is kind of useful. Yeah, that's really cool. Okay, great. Well... Um, we'll get the shift, uh, shift registers in there, I suppose. Yep. Hopefully we have enough shift registers. Stephen is happy, good. Oh no. I've opened the worst, the wrong end of this. We're going to go for the other end instead. There we go. Excellent. Make sure that these are, in fact, all the correct shift register. So, checking that these chips are all what they say they are, or, or what I they hope so, or what they mm. should be, anyway. For those following along, um, the shift register chips gives you a serial data in and a serial data out, which means you can daisy chain them together, and then you just tie the clock, everything's on the same clock line. So you set data on the first one, hit clock, data goes into the first one, out of the first one, into the second one, out and all the way down the line. Um, and then the rest of the chip gives you an 8-bit um, an 8-bit output on eight different data lines that perfectly run a seven-segment display plus its decimal point. Yeah, shift registers are magic. Don't have yep. enough I.O., add more shift registers. And I can't remember the part number, but there's an equivalent for input where you can um, have eight bits of input and it, the data comes back to you on a shift register bus kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah, uh, when I first found out about using shift registers to expand microcontroller I.O., it was quite a moment of reckoning because you spend so much time optimizing your stuff to try and, you know, use the use the number of pins that you have available on the, 
whatever cheap microcontroller you have and then being able to just throw a shift you know say to, to heck with it <laughs> just give me more io and throw a shift register in there it's quite handy really i mean obviously depending on what you're doing the shift register is going to be slower because yeah. you have to clock all the data out and you don't get you don't necessarily raise an interrupt when the io line changes yeah but for a lot of functionality particularly running blinky lights none of that really matters yeah very good and these are probably basically period accurate shift registers as well i mean aside from the fact that they're like high speed cmos variants on the part yeah because these and then when I, when I was designing the rest of the hardware there were actually some design decisions on how to physically wire this up so by putting the clock line from all of this SPI bus, the clock line turns up on pin zero or bit zero of the um, I.O. It means that I can toggle the clock line by just doing an increment decrement instruction. Oh, neat. Oh, that's good. Rather than having to set the set, yeah. load, the, load the register, change the register, set the register twice, Yeah. I can literally do increment memory, decrement memory, and that will magically twiddle the clock bit. Um, cool. which is which is quite a nice way of um, manipulating things in a hurry. So yeah. there are, even though it's inefficient and slow, there are things you can do in hardware to shave a few clock cycles off. Yeah, some of the stuff that goes on. Is that a standard trick, or is that something that you've invented? I read it somewhere on the internet. It's not my invention. Yeah. I think it's reasonably standard. I think a lot of people do that. Um, but as soon as I saw it, I just went, "Yeah, that's kind of yeah. obvious," and I'm going to do it. Just realize we've got two different vendors here. We've got, I guess that one's Texas Instruments. It's got a little picture of Texas on it. I don't know what this one is. It's got kind of like a picture of like an angry swan or something on the chip. I don't know if you can see that. but No idea. We've missed an opportunity to make this aesthetic and put all of the same vendors' chips together, but that's okay. I mean, these often referred to as jelly bean parts as every man and his dog manufactures the yeah. 70, 74 series logic stuff and they're all pin compatible, electrically compatible. So it, it shouldn't make any difference if they're all mismatched. It should just work exactly the same. Indeed. I'm just going to tack each one for now because then we can come back and just solder the whole thing in one go. Yep. Have you ever seen those um, HP bubble LED displays that were popular in the 70s? I have seen them. I haven't seen them anywhere recently. Um, but yes, I know they they, uh, they used to be very popular, as you say, the 70s. It's kind of a little um, plastic bubble that acted as a magnifying lens. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've got a, an HP calculator from the 70s that uses them i had to replace uh it's got three uh units in the thing of like four digits each i had to replace the middle one um and right. tra track down some replacement um bubble leds from bulgaria um a couple of years ago but it's it's it, amusingly similar topology to this where it's got shift registers along the top and then it's got some um uh passive stuff and then the the Kind of LED displays sitting below it. Yeah. And if, if that HP calculator from the 70s, that would be all um, RPN notation, I'm assuming? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. The good stuff. Nice. It's technically programmable, but I've never really managed to make it through the programming process uh, um, when I wasn't just typing in someone else's program. It's got a pretty obtuse user interface, but... It's a gorgeous thing, and it's amazing that it's still as functional as it is after so many years. Um, you know, just probably just a bond wire or something popped in one of the LED modules, I think. Yeah, it's a little bit sad when you compare the <clears throat> the the finesse and grace of those modules with like a you know basic modern seven segment um, LED display, but. The seven segment still has its own charm, I reckon. It does, it does. 
when I did one of the earlier prototypes of this, um, I got the PCB manufactured, and then when I needed to buy the seven segment modules, I just went into JCAR locally and said, I want some seven segment modules. And the guy's like, yeah, yeah, cool. Behind the counter, shuffle, shuffle. They only had four of the nice red seven segment modules that I wanted. Yeah. So I got two of the fancy new, like, electric blue kind of ones. The uh, ice, the yeah. ice blue. Yeah. Yeah, it's not right, is and, it? Well... It kind of worked out okay because the way this display is built, you'll see that the layout on the board there's a slightly bigger gap um, between the modules. The first there's the first four and then a gap, and then the second, the last two. Yeah. And that's because it's the four on the left is your address, and the two on the right is your data. So they are slightly, very, very subtly offset in the in the board layout. Okay. Yeah. Well, that meant that I had the address bus in, in red and the data in blue, which was actually kind of cool. It didn't have the classic 1980s look I was going for, yeah. but aesthetically it still kind of worked. Yeah, that's kind of neat, actually. Uh, yeah, okay, so I see the gap that you were talking about uh, in the board now. I hadn't actually noticed that. Have you thought it about... Is, it is reasonably, yeah, it is reasonably subtle. It's only two or three millimetres. Yeah, yeah. Um... We should stick a silkscreen uh, line or something there. I might even put a make a little three D printed separator or something. I wonder about it. You could uh, separate it with the um, the the dot on the display even. Oh sure, there's there's a variety of ways that it could be visually separated. Mm. I just laid it out as physically slightly slightly yeah, separate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, fair enough. It looks good. I do think I'd like to um, maybe laser cut a little diffuser panel or something to go um, over the, the top of this at some point. Yeah, well, at some point I'm thinking about an entire 3D printed case and a diffuser panel and all that kind of stuff. Mm. The other thing in the design that I'm still mulling, a lot of this has design features that are sort of around me for future expansion slash um you can customize it any way you wish yeah instead of the power connector just being a barrel jack the power connector is two header pins if you want you could hook that up as you've done you can hook that up to just some wires off the back mm. what i'm thinking is actually building headers that go out the bottom of the board that will then connect to a third board underneath that'll have like a five volt regulator and a lipo battery pack and all that kind of stuff on yeah, a nice lower board yeah i actually um, built something very similar to that for my uh, membership card that holds a little uh, actually a replacement battery from an ipod yeah yeah that kind of a thing is um a, a, a thin lipo battery a five volt regulator and then just header pins that come up into the back of the compute board um because you know that the way that header is done you've got options as to how you want to power the board yeah makes sense we discussed last time there's that jumper on the compute board for the clock yeah by default you put the jumper on and you get the one megahertz clock from from the crystal job done but if you wanted to you could take that, that header off and clock the board externally from whatever you want because the 6502 can clock down to essentially zero yeah you can clock down to, to less than one hertz and it'll still behave yeah, no hand but that, was, that was the design yeah. feature of by putting in a, a, a header and a jumper. Yeah. It gives lots of room for experimentation. Yeah. And the display board here that you're working on actually has a similar thing. There's another header um, on the left-hand side of the board for, di for the display. The shift registers, their output enable is active low, so that jumper just ties it low, so the display is active. Yeah. But at the same time, that header pin, you could tie in, and I'm, I haven't done this yet, but you could tie that into some kind of um, external clocking um, to, to get display dimming in software. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, that's, that's quite neat. It's like a, in its basic form, it's kind of like a power saving thing, right? And then... You could software yeah software so i mean power saving and also you know brightness and dimming mm. but the idea is by cycling 
by cycling that pin high and low and fiddling with the duty cycle, yeah, um, you 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 can change the brightness. In theory, I haven't done it yet. Yeah, but there's that header pin there that if you wanted to experiment with that, it's yeah. it's kind of the hardware's ready to go. Yeah, that's cool. I hadn't considered that, but that makes perfectly good sense. When I had initially thought about building a um, an eight bit kind of trainer thing similar to this back in the day, I had a couple of ideas. One of which was to build it into a briefcase, uh, which I thought would be kind of neat for like dragging at places. Um, and I absolutely, I absolutely have a photo of like a old school breadboard computer in a briefcase as one yeah. of the sort of reference photos I had when I was thinking this through. Is what would it look like in all of that yeah and yeah mount, mounting it into a um fancy briefcase had crossed my mind at one point i've also still got the plastic project box that i bought about 15 years ago from dick smith's i think or jcar which was going to be my other <laughs> was going to build my z80 in there but uh never really got yep. much further than mm -hmm. um laying out a front panel and buying the plastic box which sure neither whereas, of which whereas these, days, a these days it's so easy that everyone's just all 3d print the case to suit whatever board i've got yeah yeah exactly now i've got a 3d printed case design project for another thing coming up um shortly so we'll be doing that but <clears throat> uh, there's something appealingly kind of proper about those those old uh project boxes that you used to get from dick smith's or whatever with the kind of front panel yep. and everything they were always too expensive for me but i have yearned to build a thing in them i've built the odd little thing in them uh over the years yes a lot of those classic um dick smith's projects that you would build as a teenager it was like 25 dollars for the entire kit and then another 20 dollars for the yeah project box put it, it in exactly right i could never afford the could never afford the Jiffy box or, or whatever it was that, that Dick's Yeah, yeah. It was very sad. All right. So that should be our shift registers. I'll just give those a quick visual inspection. Looks okay to me. Slightly manky soldering on one of those pins. Let's take some pride in our work and fix that. All right. How are we looking? Good. Looks computery. We got all the chips the right way up. I feel like that's an achievement. Yep, um, chips the right way up matters quite a lot. <laughs> yep. All right. Uh, let's put some capacitors in and. Uh, stashed the uh, stashed some leftover capacitors and um, jumpers in a IC tube last time so get those out again and we're gonna need the other bag of capacitors as well need the same yes they're all one of fours very good My first prototype of the display subsection, actually my first prototype of all of us didn't have any of the um, decoupling capacitors and it all worked fine. Yeah. But the more I read on the internet, everybody said, when it goes wrong, it'll go wrong in a way that you will not be able to figure out what the hell is wrong with it because yeah. it'll be such a weird, untraceable, intermittent fault um, if you don't have capacitors. So I added, it, added them to the design. Yeah, no, I think it's, I think that's, Worth doing, really, for a few extra cents per chip. Yep. I see you've improved your power supply arrangement rather than trying to do <laughs> yeah. allocated clips directly to those header pins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is uh, this is a substantially better, although 
Um, I need to replace the, the alligator clips on this cable because they're getting a bit rusty uh, for reasons that are somewhat unclear to me, but um, possibly they were too near to an electroplating project at some point in the past. But yes, this works a lot better. That was part of the troubleshooting for um, getting the memory sorted out. Capacitors are in. We'll get those soldered. Were there any questions or queries or comments from the chat while well, we solder these in? SS23 has been disturbingly quiet in chat. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, I guess it's not IRC, so maybe he doesn't know how to use it properly. Yes, it's a suspicious. I don't. Uh, we need to get somebody who can. Um, someone with their finger on the kick button. <laughs> I see. SS23 says he's enjoying the conversation. Oh, good. Nice. Excellent. <clears throat> I'm definitely going to enjoy cleaning the flux off this board as well. I think this new solder, uh, even though it was the same brand, it's quite a few years newer, uh, the flux is quite a lot stickier. Um, so it's making a little bit of a mess of the board. Probably should invest in some slightly more brand name solder at this point. If anyone has recommendations for, for solder that they like, then feel free to chuck those out. supplier caps in there so um, I think that just leaves the jumper and the LEDs is that right that's the stuff all right cool well and then I had it finished to the other board obviously yes yes let's get the LEDs in the LEDs are a bit of a hassle to get to go into the board right because you're trying to line up yeah um, Quite a, quite a few pins all at the same time, and the holes are it's a it's a reasonably tight fit. Again, there's a question as to whether I could do slightly bigger holes in the in the like the drill. Yeah, pattern. that would probably be sensible. I think I think it's the same uh, it's the same story with the other <clears throat> the other pads where um yeah it's just a slightly smaller pad than is desirable but it wasn't too bad it was fairly tolerable i assume the um <clears throat> the dots go down and the leds lean to the right uh, cor per... yep correct decimal point at the bottom yep good good as dictated by convention exactly yeah i don't think the build document actually states that explicitly i thought it would be a given but yeah you're right if you put it in upside down weird things would happen yeah these are also another thing that was always such black magic to me um as a as a teenager uh, oops shorted out the shorted out the power there slightly um <clears throat> just because you have to kind of like binary encode the the number that you're displaying yeah, back in the day, you could get chips that would do, you could send it binary in and it would do hex decoding. So mm. if you gave it like, if you gave it 0001, it would light up the right segments to display the digit one. Yeah. Um, those chips don't exist anymore to display hex. So you can get them to display 
um, zero to nine, but you can't actually get them to display A through F. Right. There are some like new old stock or obscure refurbished parts, but no one appears to be making brand new chips that will actually do full seven segment hex decoding, <clears throat> which I thought was really weird. Yeah, I hadn't realised that. You'd think, if anything, maybe the hex applications would be um, possibly even more common than uh, yeah. decimal. Um, and that's part of the reason, part of the logic for the design that I've got with shift registers, mm. as I actually, I essentially do all that hex decoding in software. Yeah. So I've got a, I've got a map in ROM that says for for a given byte or a given half byte. Um, what segments need to be lit up or not lit up is all actually encoded into the ROM. Yeah, makes sense. I'm going to be extra cautious about overheating these. They are one of the more expensive components in the entire design. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the CPU weighs in at, I think, 12 or $14.00. Most of the other glue logic is in the few cents a piece. The seven segment modules are about four or five dollars a piece. They're also mainly made of plastic. They are mainly made of plastic, yep. <clears throat> and LEDs don't like being overheated at the best of times. I and don't... I see SS, SS23 having opinions as to how you're soldering with your left hand but seem to have your solder spool on the left hand side which looks awkward etc ss23 is right it is awkward thanks for the question <laughs> <clears throat> uh, it's just a <clears throat> a quirk of where i had space on my desk mainly yeah it's pretty tolerable really strangely i've never really soldered with the directly from the spool i tend to run out a six or eight inch piece of solder yeah and cut it off and then just solder with that and then cut off another six or eight inch piece i've never actually worked with a piece of solder directly from the spool the way you do yeah everybody seems to have their own kind of uh, personal thing that they develop um, oh absolutely yeah i've had this uh spooly spool thing for i don't know 10 years i think i got it when we were doing a lot of building prototype things for KiwiCon a few years ago and it was just like we were soldering for hours and hours across multiple days and it just made things a bit a bit easier. That's possibly the origin story. I don't really remember. It's actually surprisingly hard to get a nice solder spool like this now. Um, I went to get one for someone else a few years ago and the market for them had just been kind of replaced by cheaper versions of the same thing that were not as nice, which is a bit unfortunate. Right. So it's probably not a particularly popular way of doing solder dispensing, I think. I guess particularly in a world where surface mount is more and more common. One of the, again, one of the design principles that I was going for at the beginning of this was um, traditional 1980s through hole soldering for everything. Yeah. But a surprising number of these parts do actually mm -hmm. exist as surface mount. Um, yeah. You can get you can get surface mount seven segment modules. Um, pretty much all of the glue logic exists mm -hmm. as surface mount. All of your resistors, capacitors exist as surface mount. I don't think there's surface mount of 6502 stuff right but that would be a, you know that would be about it it's if you went surface mount i'm not convinced the board would actually be that much smaller yeah 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 it's surprising um you would definitely think that that someone was making surface mount 6502 stuff by now but i guess if there's just no demand for it A question of can you get surface mount socket? I have no idea. Yeah, um, you can. 
so you can get a surface mount socket for through hole components to then go on to. Oh, oh, hello, RFC six nine one nine. Yeah, that's a good question actually. Now that I see what you're what you're asking, yeah, like a surface mount ZIF socket. That would be an interesting thing, wouldn't it? I feel like it would be enormous. <laughs> it might uh, it might defeat some of the purpose of uh, surface mounting it, but. See how we're looking. Good enough, I think. Cool, clip those down. Try and not have them immediately shoot straight into my eyes. Yeah, I've always wondered as to what the value is in trimming off the um, legs of the LED modules. Yeah. Because they don't actually stick down that far and they're stiff enough that they're not going to bend over and short on something. I'm really just doing this for aesthetic purposes. Um, sure. Yeah. I had the same thought. They're kind of in that weird grey zone where there's not is that it worth much it? point. Yeah. But. This way we can do bold port domes on the whole board. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> the most important step of the uh, assembly process. Right. Oh, we should um, we should catch up with uh, what the, uh, the the cutoff spin is looking like. So, this is our bin of leftover bits from this project so far. Right. That's pretty, pretty, pretty typical. Yep. That's good. I used to, and sort of still do, obsessively keep all of the clipped off bits for running uh, jumpers between things, but less of an issue these days. I mainly keep them in a little jar so they don't end up on the carpet. Yeah, that's also very important. That's looking pretty good. So we'll just put in the jumper. Hello, NZ Smarty. Nice to see you today. NZ Smarty is a very professional um, person who is good at these things. So generally any advice that they have is worth taking, I think. <clears throat> Some tape. It's that time again. Time for the blue tape. That didn't work. Did not work at all. Yeah, the pads for the uh, the pads for the jumper are much better sized. Actually, it's a lot nicer to solder. All right, we probably need those headers now to go down to the other board. I imagine. Uh, yes. So the best way of doing this, and I suspect it's in the documentation, is if you solder the mail headers onto the compute board. Yep. And then put on all the little brass standoffs yep. that aren't brass but you know what I mean the yep. little standoffs that way you can get the spacing to the top board and then plug in plug in all the headers sandwich all the boards together and then once you've got the spacing right you can run through and actually solder it up yep that sounds very sensible that's sort of what I was thinking, imagining we would do so okay goodbye computer we have to turn the power off and we'll take off our <laughs> Venerable debug LED, which has served us very well. That can go back in the box. So let's see, these two headers. Um, I assume you want to just use the pin strips on the bottom? Yes. Cool. Yes, essentially, yeah, yeah, male headers, yep. 
good. Oh, yep, and these ones are tight in the footprint as well. Yep, and I've updated the yeah. um, updated the, uh, the the board design to nice. increase those by, I think, 0. 0.1 or something in a millimetre. Nice. We'll just press the entire computer down onto the desk to get that in there. There you go. Nice. Very solid. So to get the two boards close enough together, um, that's why you've got that low profile zip socket going on for the ROM. Right. Okay, that makes a lot of sense actually, yeah. If you if you use a full height zip socket, which you can just, um, you get a touch interference between the two boards. Right. It's enough that if you're really, really careful, you can make it work, but technically it doesn't fit. RFC 6919 in the chat says that we can just bend the legs on the 6502, which is something that I have had to do in the past when I put the wrong footprint onto a board for the parts that I actually have, so <laughs> can confirm that that works. Um, the are, these the, are these the headers that go on the other side, or have I lost the, the correct headers? Uh, so what you want is, yeah, those are the headers that go on the other side. Right. Um, in that bag is a bunch of, a sort, it's a, an assorted grab bag of headers from Adafruit. And you should be able to find one that, uh, you should be able to find two that are eight wide. Because I think there's an eight, a five, and a something. Okay. I don't know. Ho hopefully you've got two that are eight wide there. Good. One... Two. Success. Maybe I sorted out. Maybe I sorted out the right headers before I even gave you the parts. I can't remember. Nice. Okay. Um, let's solder on the bottom ones before we get too carried away, because otherwise I will forget to do that. Yep. Solder on the bottom ones, and then do all your little brass standoffs. Nice. It is convenient with the um, <clears throat> slightly undersized holes having the, <laughs> the the heaters just stay put while you solder them. That part of it's nice. That is that is true. That is quite nice. So the number of pens doesn't quite line up, but. <coughs> Within reason, one of those headers does all the SPI stuff to the display, and the other header does all the keypad row column stuff. I think it's not quite that simple, but that's the basic premise. Right. <clears throat> okay, very good. So, in terms of getting this lined up, we've got machine screws, we've got the um, hex. What do you call these hex couplers and we've got washers and you have some little washers yep so what's the what's the stack up here it's machine screw washer board hex coupler yeah i haven't i haven't quite figured that out myself as it's a little bit of um give it a go okay what i've done what i've done on the board that sits here with me is i've got from the bottom it's Screw, then PCB, then washer, then hex coupler, okay. then washer, then board, then screw. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really not too fast as whatever you think works. All right. Well, we'll do some exploration then. I'm sure some mechanical engineer would have strong opinions as to where washers should go. Well, generally speaking, you want them to go under the machine screw. Um... True. And particularly on the top board, there is one section where the traces go very close to the machine screw. So if yeah. the screw was to rub on the trace, it would yeah. ruin it. So having a washer in there is probably not a bad idea. Yeah. All right. Let's let's aim for that. All right. Let, let's do it your way with um, washers by screws and just have the hex couplers directly on the board. Okay. Hopefully that works. Yep. Cool.
I mean, not that any of this is particularly critical, I think, as long as the spacing's right. When I did my last build, um, I had I only had a full hut zip socket. So I was smart and went out and got extra long hex couplers. So instead of having the 15 mil that you've got there, yeah. I went out and got 25 mil hex couplers, thinking that, that that would be a smart move because it would separate the boards enough to have the full heights of socket. Yeah. Which seemed like a great idea. It's just your header pins don't reach anymore. Yeah, I was going to ask if that, uh, if that still works. So the, the prototype that I've actually got sitting on the coffee table here, um, I'm using the 15 mil hex couplers with three or four washers to just buy just enough room yeah. that I can get a the full height of socket to work. Makes sense. But they'd be less than a millimeter between the um, ROM chip and the lower and the upper board. Right. <clears throat> Put these on. Line this up. So there are actually there's um, spacing and layout for six uh, hex coupler mounting points, but you probably don't need them all at this point if you don't. Oh, want of it. course. <clears throat> no, we do. We absolutely need them. I was missing those ones. Thank you. This thing's got to be solid. After all, if we're going to space with it, we don't want it to fly apart. Look at that, so professional, industrial. It's quite nice. I think the aesthetic of that as a thing is quite quite solid. Now we'll just try and line these up. Yeah, getting these to line up the first time for soldering is a bit fiddly. Right. <clears throat> okay, I see how this goes. So the... <clears throat> Have a look at this and tell me if that's right. So we want these to be offset a little bit like that, I imagine. Yeah, so the idea is that they don't go all the way to the upper board because that yeah. gives you variation depending on where you put your washers and yeah. things like that. If you sold them hard against the upper board, then it wouldn't reach properly. Yeah, yeah, that makes perfect yeah. sense. All right, very good. We'll just see if there's any other places where I think a washer is necessary. I think that's all good, and we can <clears throat> put a couple of screws in from the top just to hold it in place. Good. Looking solid. Get this tape off my hand. And make some aesthetically pleasing solder joints. Yeah, 
and then this is another point that once you've soldered these you will probably go along and clip the access from the top yeah because they do stick up a little more than necessary depending on how much spacing you put between the two boards yep yes i can see these being quite stabby um right next to the keypad otherwise yep <clears throat> And with those looking good, <clears throat> chop these down. <clears throat> I reckon I am going to do bold port style blobs for these ones just because they are quite touchable and it would be nice to have them smooth yep although i suppose if you're holding this then the entire back of the entire back of the thing is as well so hence the warmth, the warmth of a 3d printed case yeah it suddenly occurred to me that the size and shape of this is extremely reminiscent of an original Game Boy. I didn't actually make any effort on the size and shape, it's just how the components happen to lay out. Yeah, but if you imagine like holding yeah, yeah. it like that, that's quite neat. <laughs> Alright, dome these up nicely. SS23 is making some comment about using a Game Boy to get on IRC. I think at this point he's, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Trolling? <laughs> SS23 trolling? Seems unlikely. It's possible. I'm not sure. I reckon you could get on the internet, or you can get on IRC with a Game Boy. Like, IRC is not very computationally complicated. Um, probably the I think worst... your biggest challenge, I think your biggest challenge is you need a TCP stack. Well, you don't even really need an IP stick. I mean, if you serial into another box, you can you can IRC. That's true. Like, like the most computationally difficult part of IRC at this point is the TLS, I think. All right, let's see if we can get a picture of that up on there. So I don't know if you'll be able to see that, but hopefully you can make out the kind of smooth blobs there for nice finger touching very tidy very tidy all right <clears throat> excellent so derek walk me through how we validate that the display is functioning uh literally power it on <clears throat> and based on that blink code that we've already got loaded yeah um it should run across the screen and light up one segment at a time from left to right all right uh, simple very, as that very exciting okay I recommend not hooking the power up backwards at this point. <laughs> yeah, we, we've largely got that out of our system, I think. Um, all right, I am going to turn the lights off for the big reveal. Um, and are you ready? Let's do this. This is where I regret putting that big reset button in there. <coughs> Hmm, doesn't seem to be super working. All right, we'll take No, the that, is, that is not what I would call working. All right, let's just, I'm just gonna take the big, nice reset button off. Although I think we got a blink out of them. Yeah, it did seem to give a blink. Um... Yeah, <clears throat> I'm just gonna take the lid off that reset button for the making easier of pressing. Oh, it's really stuck on there. 
<laughs> ah. All right. I'm sure that's fine. All right. Get us the juice again. Interesting. Okay. I think we're at multimeter time as see if, you know, check for five volts and yeah. go from there. All right. Very good. <clears throat> well, this is good. It enhances the fun of the process if it doesn't work entirely, entirely right out of the gate. Um, so let me just grab <clears throat> seven four five nine five pin out. Pin configuration. Alright, as you can sort of guess, 16 is VCC and 8 is ground. <coughs> so we'll just pick one of these and see if they're getting any juice. Yeah, it's getting some juice. <coughs> We're not getting any wild current draws, so there's probably no like gross shorts or anything happening. Um, <clears throat> if, I, <clears throat> if I had to take a punt, it looks to me like the reset line is being held low. Yeah. Just based on behavior. Um, what I'm wondering is, can you put the debug blink LED back on that um, SD card interface and then reassemble the two boards? Because it should still be able to blink its little light with the two boards assembled. Nice. And that'll tell us whether the CPU is still running. Good call. Well, let's see if it can blink at all anymore. Okay. So we have <clears throat> we have blinkage. It's tempting to just plug the plug the top board in while it's like. Uh, yeah, I would I would add the top board. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> and see what happens. I'm just gonna. Bend. And if I had to take a punt, I would suggest that when you add the top board, the blinking will stop. Yeah. I think I uh, agree with your analysis there. Okay. Oh no, here we go. We're running now. Look at that. Mildly. Yeah, I don't know what the fault was, but that's exactly what it should do. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's just do a bit of um, jiggling. Maybe there was just a short because I did give the back a little, a little rub. There might have been a, a stray bit on there. Okay, well that's very satisfying. Yeah, there might have been a stray stray wire on the reset line or something. Yeah, <clears> nice. <throat> All right, very good. Well, we're almost completely finished testing this. So at this point, the only thing left to do is uh, solder on the key switches. Yeah, very good. Label the keys themselves and flash the final ROM, and you're kind of in business. All right, let's do it. It's a home stretch. Ah, oh, that looks nice. I love that glow, that, that warm, friendly red glow. Very nice. SS23 suggesting we do a power up, power down, and power it up while both boards are connected. That's a good I idea. Don't, I don't think that would be a problem, but it's worth proving uh, an end-to-end -end test, as it were. <clears throat> okay, yeah, it definitely doesn't want to power on with this board connected. Interesting. I wonder if it's... Um, let's just blank the display and reset it. So what are we... Yeah, we're not running now, according to the LED. If we reset now, 
Yeah, interesting. It doesn't want to start up even with the display blank um, pulled. I would double check the soldering on your header pins between top and bottom board. I'm wondering if you've got something sketchy going on there. Hmm. <clears throat> I wonder if I pull this while it's live and then reset. Okay, that works. So pulling it while it's live and resetting it works. Um, we're back to running now. So let's see what we've got. That all looks more or less correct to me. Oh, there might be a short there. Hang on. Get my pokey thing. Time. <clears throat> no, it's pokey thing time. <laughs> sure. Okay, no, that's fine. The fact that it runs perfectly once you get it running makes me think it's something holding the reset line down. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm wondering if, um, because we saw the, we see the display blink uh, when power comes on, right? And I wonder if that current pulse is kind of um, upsetting something, like getting something to latch up uh, or not start correctly. Potentially, but again, pushing the reset button should clear any of that sort of problem. Yeah. When when the five nine fives power up, they power up with random state in them. Mm. The fact that it's then blinking and displaying nothing makes me think the reset line is getting pulled down. Okay. But then. Ah, oh, the, the the display blink jumper doesn't appear to do anything. Is that expected? Well, that's also kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Although to be fair, that is an act of low. So if it's not connected to anything, it might be our only blanks if you explicitly pull high. Ah, uh, right, right, right. I've right. never really played with that part of the functionality. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Well. <laughs> yeah, that worked. Yeah. Okay. So blanking out the display crashes it. I do feel like this is a kind of too much current is being drawn through the um, the things because if we reset it there again, it's back to back to good health. Interesting. Well, let's just keep going. I reckon because if we can get it to kind of work, um, then I'll be happy enough for today. I think. What do you reckon, Derek? Uh, yeah, just, just keep rocking along for now while we while we think about it. Yeah. All right, key switches. I love these key switches. They're so satisfyingly tactile. I had some older versions of these where the um internal spring that's used for the click bar came out through the bottom they were kind of like the first run of these switches and no pcb that has been designed for them accommodates for that so i had to go through and chop the the spring off all of them which was extremely frustrating Let's do that many at once. It seems seems sensible. <clears throat> Is this going to work? No, let's do fewer. Make sure that's 
sure these are nicely seated. Good. Cool. Three working key switches. So it'd be nice to know where I can buy these switches either locally or at a better price because at the moment I get them via Adafruit and they're comparatively expensive. Yeah, um, I think you can get them from a company called Novel Keys novelkeys.xyz um, I think that's where I got my ones from but okay. uh, maybe wrong about that <laughs> they're not generally too expensive when I bought them um, so there's probably a better supply than Adafruit if you're worried about the cost So I did at some point get enough of these to make a whole keyboard. Nice. Which was quite satisfying. <laughs> and in fact, my Minute Reform laptop has the uh, brown version of these. <coughs> as the, the system, yeah, the system it, again, as mechanical keys are, uh, there's more, more clicky or less clicky, aren't there? Yeah. Yeah, so the... These are interesting switches. I don't know if you looked into it at all, but they um, use a novel clicker mechanism that uh, wasn't previously uh, available in computer keyboards where there's a special spring called a click bar that kind of lifts up and then slaps back down again onto a piece of plastic to make the click sound. So they've got kind of a different actuation profile to your average like Cherry MX or... Um, these kind of compete with Cherry ML, which were the low profile uh, Cherry key switches, but I think these are considerably right. nicer. The, um, I think the first few revisions of the Minute Reform used Cherry ML and then they switched to these um, just because they're a bit of a nicer, nicer design. I've actually got a few boxes of some of the other styles of these ones as well, so we could make a silent running version of this if we wanted to. So I've got some of the ones that don't have the click bar in them. Cute. They're actually still pretty nice, like they've got quite a nice smooth action. Yeah, I do wonder if um, maybe just adding some extra bulk capacitance uh, to the power input on this might stabilize that start up with the uh, LEDs attached. Run that by me again. Adding a bit of bulk capacitance might help with the startup, um, so that there's a bit more 
of a buffer um, when that current draw happens? When it, when Potentially, it... what I've actually been mulling is the resistor that we've used that in my design was a 1K and you've put in a 3 and a bit. Mm. The reset line as it stands on the compute board is driving the 6502 and the pair of 6522s. Yeah. <clears throat> When you add the top board, the reset line also has to drive all of the shift registers on the 595. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if that resistor is too high a value to play nice when both boards are connected. Yeah, that seems fairly believable. Well, we can test that hypothesis pretty easily. Yeah. Even if you um, parallel two of your yeah. resistors to get you into the one and a half K territory rather than the three K territory. Yeah, I was just going to suggest that. One thing, one thing I've been meaning to ask is, as it stands, the only thing holding those keys to the board is the salt joints themselves. Yeah. Is that normal? I mean, there's tiny little plastic nubs po poke through the board. Yeah. Should there be should there be some glue or something also holding them on? No, I think it's fine for these low profile switches. Um, I mean, you generally divide your key switches into like board mounted or plate mounted designs. Um, and I think having the nubs takes up a reasonable amount of the kind of ability for them to move around and flex the solder joints anyway. So I'm not super yeah. worried about that. Cool. All right, key switches are on. Get some keycaps. I actually have a bunch of laser etched versions of these in a box somewhere. Um, nice. With uh, legends on them, but we uh, we'll use your. Now what I what I do is I actually label the keycaps before I stick them to the board. Oh yep, yeah. yep, yep. That's not a bad plan actually. Oh, I want the keycaps though. Uh, I'm going to do it the other way around. I'm going to ignore your your good advice. That's fine too. <laughs> um, I assume you're putting the kind of sloped bit of the keycap towards the front. I think that's standard, isn't it? Correct. Yeah, yeah. the slopey bit down to the to the bottom, as it were. Yeah. Nice. <clears throat> yeah. No, I just want to be able to press these, but um, I don't want to label them yet. So. Ah. So satisfying, really good. Love these uh, key switches. There are some 3D printable models floating around for these caps as well, but I think they're not super sturdy. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, Stephen. We're going to get them nice and greasy so that the adhesive will stick. It's okay. We can wipe them down. I spent quite a bit of time mulling over how to get nice white lettering on my black keys. And what I've actually come up with, uh, as per what's in the box there for you, is using um, the Brother label maker machine, the Brother, I can't remember what they call it, I think it's like a ZTE or something. Yeah. Um, and you can buy different colours tape, yeah. and it'll print different coloured stuff on all the colours of the rainbow. Um, and you just buy the right tape to go into the machine and you can get white font on black background. Yeah, so then I print nice. out I print out all the stuff I need to go on the keycaps, cut them to roughly the right width, um, and stick them on, and that works remarkably well. Yeah, I'm a fan of those Brother P-Touch printers. I like the weird exotic ribbons that you can get for them. Um, a friend of mine just got some heat shrink ribbon for the P-Touch series, which is particularly nice. That's pretty cool. Print straight onto heat shrink and then just chop it and shrink it down. All right. Uh, look at that. 
That's quite nice. Very professional looking keypad. Okay, I think we should experiment with your theory that um, we need some uh, lower output impedance on our reset driver. Um, yep. So what I am going to do is I am going to rummage around in my resistor pile and see what I've got that's a bit more suitable and we can parallel that. Almost wonder, we could just about use one of these 400 ohm guys because it's pretty close to 1k. Yeah. Or you could make a um, cute little stand up if you, whatever it's called, mount them radially and tie a pair of them together in series. Oh yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. We'll have 800-ish. Then we'll, we're, we're guaranteed yeah. to have enough, enough yeah. drive current. Very good. I mean, I mean you're, you're, you're almost within the tolerance territory of correct. Mm -hmm. I like that plan. I like that plan a lot. Alright. Get out of here. I so Officially, the reset for the 6502 is you pull the reset line low for six, I think it's six or eight clock cycles or something like that. Um, the original Ben Eater design has a resistor capacitor arrangement that everybody on the internet agrees just does not work. Right. So every time you power up, you still have to push the, the reset button because reset on power up does not work. I investigated, there's a component that I can't remember the name of, but basically looks like a transistor. It's a little flavor yes. that, that does power on reset of once the supply voltage gets above 4.8 or whatever, it holds the reset line low for 100 milliseconds, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. I had nothing but trouble using that. <clears throat> However, that was probably because at the time my bench power supply was rubbish and I was only getting about four and a half volts into the board so <laughs> it wasn't right. resetting reliably because I wasn't getting into the voltage tolerance yeah it was saving you from yourself something like that um so then I simply decided on a much bigger capacitor hence the um tantalum going on there I simply put in a much bigger yeah. capacitor that takes a lot longer to charge and that seems to work quite nicely yeah. But at the same time, as you say, there's a that resistor is pulling the reset line high, and the capacitor pulls it lower until it has charged. Um, but if the if the resistor was way too high, then it might not be capable of um, getting the reset line where it needs to be. <clears throat> All right, there we go. We've made a one k ish resistor. Being that the resistor values is the one major thing that has been changed since the original yep. design, um, that's the thing I'm most suspicious of. No, I quite agree. I think that's very sensible. All right. Let's re -sandwich. You want to be sharing and just hook up the top board and see if it works on power up? Absolutely. I'm re sandwiching as we speak. All right. Lights off. Power it up. <laughs> It's not working, and we can't reset, and it's not clocking by the looks of things. Interesting. All right, let's take that off. Reset. Machine is working. And we're counting. Interesting. Okay, we've definitely definitely got enough drive juice now because we've got a lower a lower value resistor than what you were using. Yeah, so the next question is can you have you got your logic probe to see what the reset line's actually doing? Yes. Let's have a look at that. Ooh, one question is gonna be where did I put the logic probe when I was cleaning up? Uh, Hmm. 
<laughs> this is like mildly inconvenient. Only a solar scope. Yeah, we can scope it. Let's let's scope it. That might be a bit easier. Uh, except I don't have the I don't have my scope set up at the moment either. That was foolish. I'm super organized today, as you can tell. Um, let's see. If you were a logic probe and you were in my office, where would I have put you? In the box with all the other test equipment? It's a good guess, but I don't think it's in there. Um, all right, let's um, let's just let's take a little, a little break, I think, and I will dig around and try and find the logic probe. Sounds good. Very good. Good, we're back. Um, RFC 6919 wins the prize because the logic probe was in fact sitting behind the oscilloscope, which is a perfectly reasonable place to put it. So, um, we're going to have a look at the reset line, I think. So the easiest place probably to grab that is going to be from the one of the 595s on the top board so i think that's pin 10 it's labeled mr bar um does that sound right derek yeah master reset yeah cool cool yeah so that's the, the reset the reset drives on the bottom board the reset drives the cpu and the two io chips but it does come through the header pins to the top board yeah to reset the display itself because it, it does a master reset on the um Five nine fives. Nice. All right. <clears throat> Sandwich time. Cool. Okay. So we're running currently. So just for the sake of interest, we'll grab a peek at pin ten. So as expected, pin ten is high. Says the logic probe. That's reasonable. So we'll power cycle. Okay, so pin 10 is high. As it should be while the system's running. Yeah, so we'll see. But at that point, at that point, the system should be running, right? Yeah, so pressing the button takes it low, and then I am getting a flicker out of the pulse light on the um, logic probe, which makes me think that it is... Well, I mean, that's the transition, I guess. I mean, maybe there's some noise there, but I mean, it seems like it's doing what it's meant to. Because pressing this button is not directly pulling the line low, right? It's just resetting the capacitor reset circuit. Correct. It, it shorts out the capacitor. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that looks correct. Um, what the else? other thing you could do is take the capacitor out of the mix and how would that work? So I, I do want to see if I can pull a clock signal off, I think. I mean, the clock should be running at all times. I would look at data or address bus. Yeah, sorry, that's what I mean. Yeah, I want to see if there's any activity, bus activity. Although doing that with this, the stack up is a little bit awkward, but we can probably get it from the back. So where's my pin out? So let's look at pin 9, which is address 0. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay, so I can see that running. Um, don't know if you can see that, but the pulse light is on on the Logic Pro. Which mean, makes me think that 
we are zooming around in memory. So it makes me think that the CPU is running. So the next question is, is there any data turning up on the data line going up to the 595s? Yeah. So let's look at that pinout. Oops. Close the tab, that's not going to help. So we should be looking at pin 14, I think, which is the serial in pin on the shift register. Well, we can deduce probably that there's nothing happening there because there's, there's no lights coming up on the LED, but... Um, well, it's the data and there's the data line and the clock line. Yeah. So it could be that I would check if data and clock are behaving because it could be that one of them is not behaving. Yeah, so data is high, stuck high. Um, Which it should be going up and down with the blink. Yeah. Well, output enable is low, which is good. And then clock is stuck high. Um, but of course, we're not currently clocking because we're not blinking the LED. So that sort of makes sense. So I feel like the CPU is just in a weird state. Where it's kind of running, but it's probably run off into into random part of memory rather than um, running the program that we want. Which does sort of make point to it not resetting cleanly. Yeah. I'm just going to add some bulk capacitance um, because sure. when in doubt, add yep. more capacitors. <clears throat> yep. Let's see what I've got. Some, find a beefcake electrolytic cap in my stash. So 470 microfarads. We'll just add that because why not? Um, probably the easiest place to add it is in parallel to this decoupling cap. Well, let's add it to the whole. We'll add it to the supply for the whole board. Might be a bit more sensible. Depending, depending on how you want to add it, you could, um, the GPIO uh, and the bottom of the compute board has a ground and VCC oh, exposed, yeah. so you could True. jack in there. True. It might be a little bit too far away from everything. I'm just thinking about kind of tacking it on there temporarily. Yeah, okay. Why not? solder on these pins. It's going to be ugly, but YOLO, as they say. Look at that, gorgeous. Very nice. All right, let's see if the machine starts up with that in place. Yes, it seems to start. All right. The, put this back on. Okay, and we are counting up as we expect. And we'll try a power cycle. That looks slightly better. 
Hmm. <laughs> okay, well, it hasn't fixed the problem. All right, so this is interesting. Let's power it up. Right, so we've got blinking activity. Attach this. Oops. Got to attach it correctly aligned. Okay. Attach this carefully in a way that doesn't crash the machine. Okay, that's working. So now if I do a reset. Yeah, so it doesn't come back after reset. That seems to be the issue. Yeah. <clears throat> so the other thing you could do is take the tantalum capacitor out of the circuit. Yeah. And that that loses you the power on reset functionality, yeah. but it means that the reset switch is basically just pulling the reset straight to ground, yeah. which might be more reliable. I'm leery because I feel like the switch bounce uh, potentially could crash the machine. Um, but... I haven't had a problem with that in the past when I did yeah. it with okay. just, just the reset switch. All right, let's just quickly try that because it's easy. But yeah, it still feels like it's something to do with the amount of load yeah. against the reset that's causing the problem. I'm inclined to agree. Okay. Um, we also could just try loading the monitor ROM onto it, I suppose. Um, uh, I wouldn't until we can get it a bit more reliable. Yeah. Okay. So that's the capacitor's removed now, so we'll try and do a reset. Yeah. So yeah, on power up it won't play nice, but on reset it should do the right thing. Yeah. Okay, so this is out now resetting correctly. Interesting. That's working quite reliably now. Okay, cool. So there's something funky in that mm, okay. resistor capacitor setup still that's not right. All right. Which well, to be fair is one of the bits that I've had the most grief with. Yeah. To get it you know, across all of my different variations. For sure. All right, well, let's move on in that case, and we can come back to figuring that yeah, out. Yeah, so if you've got that bit. resetting reliably, we're now in a position where, as you say, you could do um, uh, compile and flash the main monitor ROM. Yeah, all right, let's get that out of the way, and then we can wrap this up and say that we, we got it more or less completed, I reckon. Okay, power off. ROM out. A friend of mine kindly pointed out that the uh, crappy Windows XP software for the Mini Pro um, actually works under Wine, so it saves me having to have a Windows XP VM hanging around just for that purpose. All right, get that in there. Get this plugged in. Have you pushed anything new to the repo since we last chatted? Nope, current right. has not changed. Excellent. In that case, this should be nice and easy. Right. Hello. <laughs> uh, let me find where I put that window. Cool. So we should have everything in here from last time. I guess it's just monitor underscore ROM. Uh, yeah, indeed, and it's just the monitor underscore ROM. Cool. And that should compile and give you a 32K blob that you flash. Nice. Oops.
Does it look like what, what we were expecting? Yep, 32k yep. eight of that. All right, very good. We'll get that flashed up. SS2020's returned with, did you fix the bug? And the short answer is, there's still something funky in the reset circuit, but when we pulled out the capacitor from the power on reset, it's now behaving, but you have to manually push the reset button when you turn it on. To be honest, I was having to manually press the button most of the time anyway, so I don't know that we've really uh, degraded the performance of it that much. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that whole power on reset, as I say, Ben Eater's original design never worked properly, and I thought I had a design that seemed to go, but it seems maybe not quite. Yeah, maybe not completely reproducible. All right, are you ready? That looks pretty good. Yeah, comes up. Nice. I'm slightly regretting not labeling the keys. Um... <clears throat> so the bottom row is R, W, X, and enter. So if you start by pushing the R key and then typing random numbers, you should get random numbers on the Oof. display. Oof. Look at that. Gorgeous. I'd say that looks like the contents of memory. Yeah. Very satisfying. All right, shall we shall we leave it here today, Derek? Uh, yeah. I mean, it depends on how you're going for timing. We could leave it there, or you threaten to um, review some of the actual code in the ROM. I reckon let's do a programming session next time and uh, get some actual software running on here. Um, I reckon. Sounds good. I've had enough excitement for today. So, um, that, that sounds good. Part, th part three will be writing code. Yeah, fantastic. All right, thank you very much, Derek. Appreciate your help with this one today. It's very exciting to see the machine finally sort of behaving itself. And uh, thanks to everybody who came along and joined us on the stream today. It was great to hang out with everybody. And uh, we'll let you know when the next stream is happening. Awesome.